Well, if you're looking for Pastor Rick, I'm not him. So Pastor Rick is our typical communicator from the stage. He and his wife, Joy, are taking some well-earned, well-deserved time off down in um, Arkansas. Their only grandchild is about to turn one. So, you know, they're having a big time down there in the big town of, I believe it's Mountain Home, uh, Arkansas, Baxter County. They were, Rick and I pretty much talk every day. We text back and forth. And Friday night, I said, hey, is it a big party night in, you know, Baker County and text a selfie. He enjoyed. They're at the Baxter County Fair Christmas Parade, of course. So they are doing well, and they will be back next week. So I want to encourage you, if you're a guest, to come back and uh, hear uh, our communicator, hear Pastor Rick. So they're doing well. Be praying for them as they return next week. Um, does, uh, does God and Santa want me to be happy? Yes. See you next week. Um, yeah, they do. Uh, if, if I was to ask you as a parent, do you want your kids to be happy, you would say, yes, of course you are. You're a loving parent. But I would beg to differ that your definition of happiness and our kids' definition of happiness are two different things. Lori and I have a bear, a little bear, not an animal. We have a grandson, that dude. I know, how do you look in those blue eyes and say no at all? Oh, we, we get to be down there in a few weeks. Can't wait to see him. Bear's almost a year old. I think he's 10 months. And he can't quite walk, but he's so close. And Bear, the other day, because we get little videos, you know, from our really wonderful, uh, well, we have three wonderful daughter-in-laws, but she takes videos all the time. So even though we're apart, Dallas, Texas, up here in Des Moines, we get to see what's happening. And this uh, one video clip she just showed, I think last week, I mean, it goes without saying that, that Bear is probably smarter than the average grandchild and definitely stronger. I mean, of course, you know that. Yeah, and just my humble but accurate opinion. And uh, so Bear is next to the dishwasher. He's found the dishwasher. And Bear is all boy. It's either 180 or it's nap time. And there's some food and changing somewhere in between there. So at this point in time, he's getting, and he's realized there's two levels of a dishwasher. And he wedges himself up against the lower part. It's open and grabs the bottom rack and picks the whole thing up. Of course, he's the strongest boy in the world. I mean, we know that. And his mom says these words, which Bear hears often. No, Bear. No, Bear is a full sentence. And uh, Bear, at that point in time, does not appreciate mom saying no. But you and I both know that lower rack especially has those tines. And if Bear picks that thing up, because he cannot balance himself and goes backwards, it ain't going to be a good day for Bear. What Bear thinks will make him happy will actually cause hurt and pain. Back many years ago, I was a part of a, of a staff. We had nine pastors. Once a month, we would go out to lunch together. This Monday, we get into our 15 passenger church van and our senior pastor says, hey, I get my oil change. Can you pick me up? We follow him to get his oil change. And it's next to a strip mall, bunch of parking spaces. And we drive in to follow him. There is a brand new Lamborghini supercar. Everybody needs one of those. We're in a series. I don't remember the specific topic, but it was basically things won't make you happy. So as we drive past it, realizing we passed it, because you know, it wasn't parked next to cars. It's parked out in the North 40, we would call it down south, to no door dings, no look dings even. And so uh, nine of us pastors in a series, nothing, things won't make you happy. We pass it, but knowing the seniors got to do some paperwork, we drive back around, pull that 15 passenger van right up next to Lamborghini. And I could feel the whole van shift because everybody was staring at the window, at the Lamborghini. And people are rattling off horsepower, top speed, how much it cost. And you could, there was quiet and probably drool coming down. And the pastor in charge of discipleship, that guy who's in charge of helping our church love Jesus more, says these words and I'll never forget it. I think I could love Jesus more if I had a Lamborghini. Now, as an adult, some of us can rationalize that. Come on, if you had Lamborghini and we're playing positive, encouraging Caleb at the stoplight, more people would be positive encouraged, right? <laughs> if, if you had that kind of horsepower, you could help more people in need. Come on, Bear has an issue, but we adults can do the same thing. And as much as we were having fun, it was a little bit of a thought in my head thinking, hey, illusions. Illusions are those things that I think, inanimate objects that I think will bring me happiness 
or contentment. When I'm getting ready to prepare this sermon in full transparency, it's the week before Thanksgiving, I'm digging in, and we don't use books anymore. We got computers, I got tablet. I'm the kind of guy I love, the more screens, the better. And I don't know about you, but you guys remember what happens the day after Thanksgiving? Shopping day, don't even call it Black Friday, it's called Rob You. And what's not fair is that they don't market fair anymore. I had these pop-ups and I'm trying to prepare to preach God's word, to teach you guys and me, honestly, what's going on. And all of a sudden these things pop up. Listen, if they were about kitty cats, good for you if you like cats. Not a distraction for me. Not an illusion whatsoever. If, if some marketing stuff came up about needlepoint, like I'm glad. I like to wear, you know, sweaters and blankets, but that's not my thing. But, you know, I, my hobby is hot rods. I like tools. I like car parts. I'm a workout guy. I like the outdoors. And it's Iowa. And they have these boots that have insulation and Kevlar gloves. And I'm like, ooh, wow, ooh, wow. Did anybody have that week of Thanksgiving? Especially, man, they, are, they don't fight fair anymore. And I was fighting, personally, distractions of illusions. I think I could use that. And I got kids and grandkids. Maybe they could use that. And I'm telling you, as I'm preparing, I am wrestling myself with illusions. It is December. If anybody's not told you, um, it's December, Christmas, 21 days away. 21. Some of you just stress just went up, right? 21 days, Christmas comes. And uh, you, or maybe you've taken your kid or grandkid, you've gone to a place, you stood in line forever, and you sat on a complete stranger's lap, pouring out the very things you want and desire. And at any other time of year, if they didn't have a red suit on a white beard, it would be illegal in every state. But we do that. And Santa Claus asked us two questions. You remember? First of all, what do you want for Christmas? Followed by, have you been bad or good? And that kind of mentality, along with the, I'm a, I'm a pastor's kid, I grew up in church. I learned a formula or at least I thought I did. And some of us, I know it's my default mode is formula. That is to make up ideas of how to get on God's good side. Now, don't look at me negatively. You do the same thing. You come up with ideas such as if I do more good than bad, then God will give me. If I go to church, maybe God will give me that contract a little bit more regularly. If I pray, maybe I'll pass the test. If I read my Bible, maybe that girl will say yes. Maybe the coach will put me in the game. And if it's really something big, right? What if I do all of it really hard? I mean, I go to church more often. I, I pray more than once or twice a week and I actually read my Bible. Maybe the contract on the house will come through. I mean, after all, God and Santa want me happy. And formulas are made up. And finally, I'm calling these the IFs, right? The acronym IF. And the last one is fantasies, made up stories that we think will bring us happiness. Now, let me say this. I'm going to add a phrase to this because the focus on fantasy is a made up story. So what about the story, made up story in your head of hopelessness? You say, Dan, you don't understand. No, I do. If you knew my story, I've had absolute times of hopelessness. I didn't know where my next, next meal was coming from. I wasn't sure if, uh, if my very life, I would have breath the next week, the next month. I've had those low points. And it's a made up story. It's not true. But if you're in the hopeless cycle, let me just tell you that lie that there's not going to be a next, that lie that says you will never find him or her, that lie that says you'll never get B, go. It's just that. It's a lie. What I know from scripture, what I know experientially is until God takes your breath and stops your heart, you have a next. Not a period, it's a comma. If you're in a made up story of hopelessness, I'm telling you today, it's not over. But if we talk about the typical fantasy that things make us happy. Lori and I do a lot of, uh, well, not a lot. We do, a, well, 30 years has been a lot, but premarriage counseling. 
And the girl comes in. She has this made up story. He's going to rub my feet every night. He's going to clean and fix everything. He's going to take out the trash without me saying a word. He's going to make up the bed. He's going to pick up the clothes. You and I both know it's laughable. And then, and of course, he's thinking this made up story in his mind. She's going to have a warm meal for me every time I walk in. She's going to greet me with a hug and a kiss and my slippers. Do you see where the made up story is going? Is that real? No, real life doesn't really happen, but these made up stories, they do come around. And what about, well, some of us, these made up stories have actions to us. And I'm sad to say, but I think it's true. And I see it permeate all over inside and outside the church. And it's this, I deserve to be happy. Anybody ever heard people say that? I deserve to be happy. It sounds right. I mean, does God and Santa want to be happy? Well, yeah, but, but, but hold on. I deserve to be happy. And my supervisor does not appreciate me, value me, and I've been here a year and a half and I do not have a corner office with a window. I'm out of here because I bet they are going to treat me better. Um, I've heard I need to be happy and my family does not support me on every harebrained, I mean, really accurate thing that I pursue. They don't acquiesce to my needs. They rob me of happiness so I will limit my time with family because I deserve to be happy. Sadly, I've heard this way too many times. I deserve to be happy. And he or she does not make me happy. I'm filing because this made up story, you know, I deserve to be happy. Let's, um, let's follow that logic to its conclusion, shall we? This is what it sounds like. I believe that God wants me to be happy. Then what does not make me happy must be wrong, right? I mean, opposite. If God wants me to be happy, then pain, discomfort, delay, inconvenience cannot be God's will. Before I know it, I become a worshiper of the false God of comfort, money, pleasure, perception, and things. If God does not make me happy, then God has failed me. Now, while you're sitting in church, you think that's preposterous, but you and I both know, myself included, I have had seasons of my life where I've thought that, God, you did not come through. And the way, the timing, and the amount that I know you should have come through, God, you failed me. And the logical conclusion of that thinking is that God and Santa want me to be happy and they are ultimately here to serve me. I mean, that's a logical conclusion. If I am in pursuit of the ifs, right? The illusions, the fantasies, the formulas, that God is here to serve me. And if he doesn't, if he doesn't. So let's be aware of the ifs. And yes, God wants us happy. But there's some things just like little bear that we think will make us happy that could actually cause us hurt and harm. I'm going to pray for us. Brian's going to sing and we're going to come back and look at what the scriptures say about God and Santa want me to be happy. So we ended with the ifs, the illusions, the formulas, the fantasies, the made up stories. And all of us, I hope, can agree that There is a little distraction, a little drift, especially this time of year. So here's the question. What is the truth? What does the Bible say about happiness? And use whatever word you want to here. Contentment, peace, joy. We're going to be reading through Philippians. And all through Philippians, Paul's dropping all these different words. Some of us like to categorize the word, but I'm just saying whatever it is. Happiness, joy, peace. I like the word Paul uses contentment. To me, it sort of culminates all of those. Let's read in Philippians 4, starting in verse 12. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. Both extremes. I have learned the secret, interesting phrase, of being content in any and every situation. Strong statement. 
Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, a verse many of us have heard, I can do all this through him, meaning Jesus, who gives me strength. So let's break this down. There's a phrase, I don't know if you're picking it up, I've underlined and highlighted, I have learned. Here's what I love about that. Paul is saying this, and Paul messed up, right? If you say I've learned, that means I have not learned. I have done it wrong. I have not hit the mark. And we know Paul had a dominant personality. And dominant personalities, because that's one of the things that uh, I teach as far as a, a pastor and a, and, a, and a leadership of the business, um, dominant peoples are easy to have fun with. Why? Because they're so overt. They're always the one out of the gate and forgetting there's other responsibilities and things to do. And Paul, I guarantee you, came up with some illusions and some formulas and fantasies. And God says to Paul, like he does to me, Shouse, we've been through this before. <laughs> Let me be God and not you. I love the phrase I've learned. Not only does it remind me that Paul missed the mark, it's, uh, it's reminding me this is not some verse to pop up or a prayer just to say and make everything go away. When I say, when Paul says, I've, I've learned, this is something he's wrestled with. This is not theoretical. This is experiential. I like it. When people are teaching me that have been there, done that, I like it. It makes sense to me. And then let's take in context who this is. This is Paul. This is not a guy like me who grew up in church. This is a guy who grew up as a Pharisee whose mission to start off with was to find every follower of Jesus and expose them, put them in prison or death. And when Paul took this crazy journey, he came face to face with Jesus everything changed. Starting from the heart, everything changed. And Paul lived happily ever after. Not what happened. A couple things when Paul says, listen, I am a follower of Jesus. I have literally come face to face with him. I know him to be real and true. He has at least three shipwrecks. He's been beaten uh, about eight different times, depending on whether it was a flog or whether it was a rod. Um, he was in prison three different times, um, stoned to death. They assumed he was dead when he was lifeless, but of course he didn't. The guy had some hard stuff, so he's not sitting in some yacht saying, hey, this is what you probably need to do. No, no, the guy's been there and done that. When he says these words, I, I've learned, and in any and every situation, he's not kidding. I have learned is a wonderful statement. Guess where he's writing this from? Prison. Not a yacht. Prison. Guys, I'm listening to a person like that. And then he says this, and I don't know, I've read this a couple million times because I'm old and been around church for a long time, but the secret, I don't remember reading the secret. Is it a secret? Well, of course it's a secret. Why is it a secret? Because back then, Back in Paul's day, over 2,000 years ago, here's what's crazy. He grew up watching the Romans and the Greeks, multiple gods doing their thing, trying to come up with illusions, formulas, and fantasies. The same things we do. And Paul grew up in a very religious place where the Pharisees, not only did they pretend like they were godly, they wanted more people to look and acquire, and they had all kind of made up stories about themselves. And Paul's like, none of that stuff works. But this, what I've learned, it's the secret. And it's the secret of being content in any and every situation. That is a strong statement. That's not most of the time. And what is the secret? Of course, we know it's Philippians 4.13 that I can do all this through him, Jesus, who gives me strength. That strength is the picture of a power source. A, a power source. So, the power source only happens not because you go to church, because you've read the Bible, you went to Sunday school one time, or you went with your grandmother. That power source is becoming a follower of Jesus, understanding that God sent his son Jesus Christmas, but yet he lived a perfect life. And Easter came and took on my sin and your sin, died, was buried, and God said, okay, this is my game plan. Overcome, come back to life. And that is why Paul had come face to face with Jesus and realized this stuff is not just religious, it's real. So the starting point is becoming a follower of Christ. And we do that 
Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us what the mouth confession is made, with the heart we believe. Romans 10, 13 says whoever calls in the name of the Lord, and that call is a surrender. God, it's, it's you I need to forgive me of my sin, to give me the promise of eternity, but a purpose right now. I'll give you my life. That's step one. And the power source for those who are followers, we know this, but let me just remind you, the power source is conversation with him every day, multiple times a day. We call it prayer, but it's just conversation. We read God's word, the Bible, and apply it. Don't just read it because we make, we got a formula, right? <laughs> we do a formula, we read my Bible, God's going to answer my prayers. No, no, I start to read it as if it's an instruction manual, as if, it's, as if it's the success manual of life, and I apply these truths. And I'm doing life with other people who love me, pray for me, encourage me, and push me forward. That's the power source. It works. You know what doesn't work? An alternate power source. Anybody have phone, tablet, computer, electric car? Everything needs a power source, man. I, in my little backpack of survival, I have a backup power source, a portable in case there's no power. I am prepared. But some of us like to use, and myself included, I like to take that power source and plug it into different places, temporary ones. Can we do a test just to have fun in church, a little test? Take your power source and let's plug it into something different. Let's plug it into your spouse. Plug it into your spouse. And when things are good, they're good. And when things are bad, they're bad. Let's take that power source and plug it into your kids. And when things are good, it's great. And when things are bad, it's low. Let's plug it into your finances. When there's money in the bank, life is good. When it's not fear, all that lack of power starts creeping back in. Do I plug it into my business? Do I pr plug it into my name the thing that you plug it? Because here's what's happening. It's not that Christians don't experience emotion, but we don't have such highs, highs and low lows. That's why Paul says, hey, this is the strength. And in every situation, not most, he's the power source. And not only does he know this to be a fact, and, and you know this true, to be true as well, if you have somebody that's your protege, somebody that you're pouring into, you want to tell them all the secrets, all the things that are supposed to happen. And in uh, Timothy, he's teaching this particular concept to Timothy. And he says, godliness, that is to be like Jesus, right? Godly, to be like God, is with contentment is great gain. Like that's the secret again. If your plug-in power is to anything different, you have a Santa Claus kind of happiness. And it comes around seasonally. And Paul is telling this to his protege. He's telling this to other church people for us to read, to read because he says, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, if we will be content with just that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires, illusions, formulas, fantasies that plunge people into ruin and destruction. If we go back even further, King David says this in Psalms 37, four, he says, delight yourself in the Lord because he gets Paul's principle here. He gets the secret sauce. <laughs> Delight yourself in the Lord above all else. And he will give you the desires of your heart. That sounds really cool. But the emphasis of that verse, Paul, David, two separate times, maybe within a thousands of years, both know the secret sauce is this intimate relationship with Jesus. And the desire, the delight, first and foremost, comes under God. And when I am having this deep relationship, his desires become my desires. I don't ask God to bless what I want with my illusions. I don't ask God to bless what I want with my formulas. I don't ask God to bless what I want with my fantasies. No, God, you lead my desires. You lead my appetites. For like little bear, if I, Dan gets left to my appetites, it ain't gonna be pretty. In fact, it's gonna be hurtful and harmful. I've been there and done that. So what's the conclusion to this line of thinking, this biblical appropriate line of thinking? 
conclusion is this, that God is not here to serve us. We are here to serve him. God is not here to serve us. We are here to serve him because he knows. In fact, even simplifying that, I just put, put the little phrase, he over me and everything. He over me, every person, every place, everything, every thought. Everything, Dan? Yes, everything. Otherwise, you're plugging it into temporary power sources and it doesn't last. The most frustrating life in the world, I promise you, is a person who says he's a follower of Jesus and plugs that plug into different things. And the world watches us like a yo-yo, like they are, there's not much difference. And the secret to being, keyword, fully devoted followers of Jesus is just that. Every area of my life. I wrestle with God hard sharing this story, but I'm praying that the point sticks. Lori and I have four boys. One of our boys, Brady, is a Missouri state trooper. State troopers go through 26 weeks. People don't know that. It's, uh, six and a half months of training. And they aren't nice because their job is to prepare them to be by themselves in some of the most heinous situations. Brady graduates and the Shouse household, you may remember my dad's a pastor, uncles are pastors. And when there's special moments, we like to get together and just encourage them, pray over them and, and bless them. And literally we'll write out a sort of a prayer blessing over them. It's a very special, very personal thing. And so I can remember writing out my blessing. And as any of us would pray for our kids, we'd pray for protection. God, keep them from all harm. And since in the line of duty, what he does as a highway patrolman, God, give him wisdom and discernment so he knows what is okay and what's evil. God, help him. Help him learn to disarm the emotion that he encounters. And God, protect him from all harm. And God tapped me in the shoulder as I was writing this. And he said, really? No harm, huh? Is that your plan or is that my plan? And in full transparency, I went, God, don't you dare go there. We have been through enough hardship in our life. Give, give our son a break. And God just reminded me, can you trust me? All those things we just got through talking about. Can, can, is it really my will over every area of your life? Or are you holding on to a few things that you think <laughs> you know better? That you can control more? That you can provide for? Honestly, what a joke. As I wrestled with God for hours, his tears just flowed. You know, those times when you wrestle with God and you know who's going to win, but I just didn't want to give it up. I had given God about seven or eight fingers. Lord, let me keep one or two things. And he said, Dan, it's either all me or none. And what I know to be true is that I can trust him. What I know to be true is that God is good. I may not see it in the moment, but I know he has. I've, I've read it, I've taught it, and I've experienced it. I know it. I know it. I know it. So I rewrote. I rewrote my prayer. And then I said, God, he's yours. And if you and your sovereign plan that I know I can trust, that I know you love him more than I do, I had to recite these truths that I know to be true. But I had held on to this area of my life and I said, God, if it's your will that Brady give his life for someone else. Make him bold and courageous. God, make him bold and courageous if that's your calling for his life. So I share that because God wouldn't let me out of the story. I had 30 I wanted to share, but my prayer, my hope, is that this principle from Paul sticks. That it is he over me in every person, place, thought, and thing in my life. 
That and that alone is where we find in any and every situation contentment, happiness, joy, peace. So I would encourage you, I'm going to do this. This is a prayer I wrote up. Pastor Rick did this a couple of months ago. I liked it. And my challenge to you, because I'm going to do this, is this is my prayer. It's not your prayer. It's mine. So you can either use it or come up with your own. But I'm praying this every day this week for me. And it's just true and honest. God, I do, I do want to be happy. Of course I do. I'm not a, yeah, someone who wants to have pain all the time. I, I know I can drift thinking you are my glorified Santa Claus. I confess I struggle to fill my appetite for contentment by doing it myself. I just do. Forgive me when I think you exist to serve me. A Santa Claus kind of happiness, right? I exist to serve you. Lord, I pray your will over my will because, and here's the key, I know that your plan and purposes gives me lasting fulfillment and contentment. It's not a hope so. It's a no so. Let me pray for us.